everybody. Welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. Today's video is a theory. While I'm using primary sources, I'm essentially sharing an idea of my own. So we're going to call today entertainment because it delves into some pretty interesting links that are probably insignificant, but some are very significant. If you followed my channel for any length of time, you already know after studying the First Council of Nicaea that Eusebius of Nicomedia and Eusebius of Caesarea are two different people that lived at the same time. However, I assert that these individuals were either the same person or that Eusebius of Caesarea was created with the specific purpose of protecting what became the orthodox view of Christianity. Let me start by giving you some background. Uh, the other night I was reading a dissertation done back in the 1970s by a gentleman named Joseph D. Smith Jr. from Yale University called uh, Gaius and the Controversy over the Johannine Literature. I ended up finding this based on what we researched in our last video in uh, the History of the Church by Eusebius. We're doing a running series on this right now, as everybody knows. And I'm always quick to identify this is Eusebius of Nicomedia that is the historian. Well, I thought I had settled this five years ago when writing Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity, but I'm reading this dissertation, and sure enough, it shows Eusebius of Caesarea, the ecclesiastical history of the church. So I'm going, wait a second. I can't be right over this Yale person getting their PhD or whatever, right? So I dive back into this again, and I find some very interesting things. First of all, I need to give you some background on several facts, just so we're on the same page. I'll try to be quick through this part, but stick with me, because I promise this will all blow your mind, okay? So first, the early church prior to the year 300. There is... A huge misperception that the church was much more organized than it actually was. The earliest church was disorganized, it was sectarian, different groups believed different things, there weren't definitions for certain terms in the faith or certain doctrines. They were developing, writing was occurring, uh, theories were put out there, and Heresiologists would write back and say, no, you're a heretic because the real Christians believe X, Y, or Z. Over time, the books became more organized, the cream of the crop rose to the top, and we ended up with a canon, etc. <clears throat> the church began to organize itself based on Roman hierarchical structure, like metropolitan, regional, local, and they put their bishops that way. So they began organizing things and... Um, in time, they decided what their beliefs would be, and they targeted the long-lasting heretics that had been just normal Christians before, but as definitions arose and became solid orthodoxy, we can now look to them. So to make this conversation easy, we're going to center around the First Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Both Eusebiuses are there. I can give you the most facts there. Let's make it easy by doing this. We're going to call one side Trinitarians, and we're going to call the other side non-Trinitarian, okay? Because we're talking about modal monarchians, Sabellians, um, all different kinds of heresies that around some form or another were different than Trinitarian belief. Now, all Christians from the beginning believed Jesus was the Son of God, that he was divine and human. The question always centered around, was Jesus co-eternal with God? Was he uh, co-equal? Had he existed in all time with God? Right? The terminology at the time was, you can't say that there was a time that he was not. Talking about Jesus, right? Anyway, so here's the argument. Now, by the time of 300, they begin organizing. Let's talk real quick about Constantine, okay? Constantine came from Britannia in the early 300s. He wins a famous battle at Milvan Bridge. His mother's already a Christian. He says he has a vision where he sees the cross in this sign you will conquer, so he does it. Um, he partners with the bishop in the east, uh, Licinius. They do it together, right? Um, years go by in the early 320s eventually Constantine overtakes Licinius II and moves the Roman power center to the east renames Byzantium Constantinople 
Nicaea is nearby to Constantinople. Nicomedia is nearby in Constantinople, modern day Turkey. So, okay. We have Constantine now, who is the emperor. And Eusebius of Nicomedia is essentially a politician, a courtier that also dabbles in the church and is a bishop, a bishop from Nicomedia, which is about an hour from Nicaea. He baptizes Constantine. Now, let's get into the details of the council itself, and then I'll tell you the conspiracy part, okay? So, at the council, the non-Trinitarians come in and say, hey, we should define Jesus as heterousios, a different substance than God. That wasn't happening, okay? An uh, uh, another side, uh, Alexander uh, of Alexandria and his star pupil, the young African Athanasius, who gives us this beautiful writing on the Trinity, he steps up and says, no, no, no. Let's go homoousios, same substance as God. Well, the group argues, well, wait, we can't do that. A hundred years ago, we said that that was heretical because that term doesn't appear in any of the common scriptures. So this Eusebius of Caesarea allegedly stands up and says, hey, how about homoiousia, similar substance to God? That compromise doesn't work. They end up settling on homoousios. But the little told part about this history is that literally right after, Everything from Nicaea is reversed. Christianity does not become Trinitarian the day after the canons of the Council of Nicaea are written. It reverses back to non-Trinitarian views. The Trinitarians are rounded up and exiled, and then they win again and take power, and then they lose again. This is a really broad generalization, but I've got to get you set up for, for my theory here. Okay, so... There you go. You have the foundation. Now let's look at these two Eusebiuses. I believe what happened was, let's use common sense first. The preface of the ecclesiastical history is 20 pages of arguing about how, well, Eusebius wasn't really an Arian, right? But this is allegedly talking about Eusebius of Caesarea. But there was confusion and he really believed this but not that. My assertion is that Eusebius of Caesarea is being used because the modern Orthodox Catholic Church, if we want to call it Catholic, or just let, let's say, let's, let's call it Latin Catholic Church, different than today, but through the Middle Ages. They can't have a non-Trinitarian writer handing down the church history, and that's essentially what they had. Get this. Now let's get into the interesting stuff. Eusebius of Caesarea and Eusebius of Nicomedia. When were they born? Well, they were born in either sometime between 260 and 265, both of them. When did they die? They both died in either 340 or 341 AD. Well, that's interesting. So let's look at the geography then. We're told that Eusebius of Nicomedia began as the Bishop of Beirut, which is in Lebanon on the Mediterranean Sea, right near Israel and that Eusebius of Caesarea was Bishop of Caesarea Maritimia, Maritime. He was not Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Maritima, right? So he was Bishop of that part of it. Well, they're about five hours apart from each other by car, right? And so when I was researching this, I thought to myself, well, is it possible they're mistaken and that this was all one district, same Bishop? So I pull up Google Maps and I say, how far is it from Beirut? to Caesarea Maritima, right? It doesn't take me down a coastal road straight to it. It goes deep into the mountains and then back out, and guess what streets you have to go on? Rothschilds Avenue is the first one. And then when you get down near Caesarea, you end up on Nakash Avenue. Nakash is the Hebrew word for the serpent in the garden. This is just too weird. It's too weird for me. I'm sorry. So anyway, this is how these things can get out of control. There's plenty of facts to state, here's the reality, but I just found these little nuances even weirder, right? Now, we have a motive to separate the history from Eusebius of Nicomedia because he was a non-Trinitarian Christian. Now, when we get outside the ecclesiastical history, what else do we have? We have writings on Constantine. That was his big deal. I mean, he writes 
works on Constantine. He writes the life of Constantine. He covers the oration of Constantine. And then he gives his own oration on the history of Constantine. And guess what? It's one of the most criticized works in church history saying, oh, this is wrong about it and that's wrong about it. So does it make sense that Eusebius of Nicomedia, the political courtier and churchman of Constantine is going to write this beautiful history or that some random guy from over in Israel that is far away is going to do it. No, it makes sense that the guy that is with him every day that baptized him, that was in his faith with him would be the one to do these writings. It doesn't make any sense that Eusebius of Caesarea would do these if this guy exists. I'm telling you, there's something to it. I, I truly believe it. And I believe it makes sense. There's a huge motive there. You can't have your church history told by a non-Trinitarian when the Trinity is one of the core fundamentals of the Christian faith. And this has nothing to do with challenging the authenticity of the Trinity. I'm challenging the narrative. And that's okay to do, okay? There are different types of apologetics. There's presuppositional apologetics that state uh, everything from the foundation that there is no rational and logical thought processes outside of God, right? There are uh, empirical ones based on evidence and archaeology alone. And then there are narrative ones like what we do where we study primary source records to get factual truth from this. It's okay to have these uh, challenges. Anyway, so... What do I make of this? I mean, there's so much. Let, let me talk for a minute about the calendar because if I want you to just do Wikipedia even on Eusebius of Nicomedia and Eusebius of Caesarea. The possibility that these two are just the same person is okay. Or the possibility that Eusebius of Caesarea is used to get the history out of the hands of a non-Trinitarian even though it is most likely written by him. I mean, everything points to it. I want to just talk about years, okay, because they're important. And I think one thing I see is that perhaps whoever knows this is trying to skirt around it by doing things like 340 slash 341. And I saw this even when I was writing my John Washington book in the 1600s. The calendar we have today is not the calendar we've always had. I mean, today in Israel, for example, it's the year 5780, okay? The chances that the years of everything we have in history prior to the fall of Rome are off is extremely likely. Dionysus Exegus ends up giving us this BC AD system much later in the 500s. So, you know, dating things is really funny. And the reason you see that slash 340 slash 341, or he was born in 1652 slash 1653, let's use a modern example, right? Today we use the Gregorian calendar. We used to use until the, I don't know, early 1700s, maybe the Julian calendar, right? And a year at that time went from April 1st to like March 31st of the next year, right? And there might have been even different days per month and everything. So you would have to have 1652 slash 53 to have it make sense in studying it against a Gregorian calendar, right? Um, and it, you also lose days and years. Uh, for example, the birth dates of the presidents are, um, you know, 11 days technically off of what they really are, you know. So now go back 500, 1,000, 1,500 years, and these dates are trustworthy. And it just so happens these two Eusebiuses that are on different parts. One guy with Constantine all the time writing about Constantine and writing the church history that just so happened to be a Christian of the stripe that was super common. Okay, that's the other thing we have to understand. There's a misperception that the Trinity was always the view and that all of a sudden at Nicaea, they just reaffirmed, and all these people came to challenge this orthodoxy that everybody knew to be true, and then everybody lived happily ever after and we became Trinitarian. This is not the case at all. To some degree, all of the ecumenical councils that have occurred, especially the seven primaries, first Nicaea, first Constantinople, Ephesus, uh, 
Chalcedon, second Constantinople, uh, third Constantinople, second Nicaea, all these church councils are essentially essential. They're arguing over the definitions and doctrines and nomenclature that help us to understand how Jesus did what he did. How did he come to earth as God and human? The question was never whether if he was. Of course he was. How do we define it? How do we put it in words? How do we worship properly, right? How do we get this thing to work that clearly has a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they're all God? These were the arguments. It wasn't a grand conspiracy to make this stuff up. I can definitely tell you that. But the underlying premise here and the issue and the reason why the dissertation I was reading ties into this Gaius and the controversy over the Johannine literature. Johannine refers to the writings of John. So we're talking about John's gospel and Revelation or John's apocalypse. These come about and by their very nature, they destroy the arguments of any non-Trinitarian because they say in the beginning was the word and he was the word. So yes, he was co-eternal. And he's co-equal according to the Gospel of John. It's almost as if the Gospel of John shows up at a time that it was needed to directly answer these challenges. I'm not suggesting that's the case. Could be. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Anyway, I'm telling you, Eusebius of Nicomedia is the writer of these church histories. And I'm sticking to that. Until somebody can show me something more substantial, it just... There's nothing there to make me think Eusebius of Caesarea plays any role in anything except maybe the one that's written about him at the Council of Nicaea, which is interesting in itself, if we're honest. Anyway, guys, if you want to support, please donate a few dollars on the PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, uh, purchase a book I've written. You can get a, a merch, a t-shirt, a cup or something. Please uh, keep track of this uh, playlist. Go watch the history of Eusebius that we're putting out right now. Uh, we're going to continue those series and also uh, incorporate some other videos in the near future. God bless you and may your work today bear fruit. Thanks.